to the FMT show. I'm Fiona. I wasn't quite ready. <laughs> oh, you saw. And I'm Trin. This is our very first episode. Yay. In, in this episode, we will predictably be introducing ourselves and how we met. We will also ask each other questions so you can get to know us even better. And then we will be discussing a topic that refuses to go away. Did, Did Jack that- really have, have to, die? to die? The f and show is an educational, critical thinking, dialogue-inducing comedy podcast. If you are a fan of the show, please follow us on Instagram at f and show podcast. So we should tell a little bit about ourselves and I'll go first. So, hey, everyone, I'm Fiona. I live in Cool Harbor, Nova Scotia. Uh, My parents immigrated to Canada before I was born from Scotland um, and I was born in Alberta. I moved around a lot as a kid and actually made the journey from Alberta to New Brunswick when I wasn't even four years old. And my brother was less than two months old and it was in a moving truck. My parents were kind of crazy. Like they packed us up in a moving truck with all our stuff and carted right across Canada. Parents are crazy. Mm -hmm. Four Um, and two months old. I know, right? Mm. Uh, so my brother and I are the only Canadians in my very large Scottish family. I have family all over the world, uh, but my brother and I are the only Canadians in my family. Um, my family then settled here in Dartmouth where I met my husband. Um, we've been married for 18 years and we have two awesome children, Alex, who is 14 and Nicholas, who is eight. And we have a very old cat penny she's 18 i call her my little old lady <laughs> and she cares i'm recording this right now um i love to read and write and talk about anything creative love to socialize with my friends and my family um we also my family and i do a lot of camping in the summer and our beautiful 33 foot long camper uh, making lots of memories for the kids and just having a lot of fun so love having awesome conversations about everything and anything, hence the reason for this podcast. And of course, I love having a laugh or two as well. Mm-hmm. That was a good introduction. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Hey, everyone. I'm Trin Bolton, born and raised in Cool Harbor, Nova Scotia. And no, I do not know Sidney Crosby or Nathan McKinnon. But in the spirit of name dropping, I do know Steve Giles. Hey, Steve, Angela, Macy and Duncan. Steve Giles competed in numerous world championships and four summer Olympic games for Canada as a sprint canoeist. He won a gold and two bronze world championship medals and a bronze medal at the 2000 summer Olympics in Sydney. I still live in Cole Harbor with my partner, Colleen, my three children, Allison 20, Beth 18 and Sarah 16 and our three dogs, Quinn, Tully and Ringer. I was born in the Halifax Infirmary in Nova Scotia's capital city of Halifax on November 14th, 1974, making me a Scorpio for those who love astrology. And by the time my brothers are born, Matthew in 1978 and Joshua in 1979, the infirmary was closed to maternity cases. And they were born in the IWK Grace Maternity Hospital, which is where all babies in Halifax are still born today. It's where my three babies were born as well. Uh, Like Fiona, I love creating. I especially enjoy writing children's books especially um i have one book published which was illustrated by children and it's called alice and the astronaut and i'm working on another one called girls don't like dinosaurs i am also working on a dystopian novel called the book of beginnings and you'll hear fiona and i referring to our novels frequently as fiona is also currently writing a novel i believe of the fantasy genre yeah, it doesn't have a name yet it doesn't have a name yet but so when we refer to our novels those are them mm-hmm I am infatuated with true crime and have been for as long as I can remember because I just can't believe humans are so horrible to one another. Um, I love sports, especially soccer, ringette, and hockey. I still play ringette and hockey, and I played soccer as recently as 2018. I've also coached competitive and recreational levels of ringette and soccer. My favorite hockey players are Natalie Spooner and Mitch Marner. My favorite soccer players are my children and Adriana Leon, and my favorite ringette players are my children. Aww. Two things that hurt my brain and my heart are injustice and when people refuse or are incapable of having a crucial conversation, just meaning they don't consider all information or points of view when discussing a topic. And that's why I'm so excited to do this podcast. Mm -hmm. 
we've had many interesting conversations over the years, eh? Mm-hmm. I'm just mm-hmm. finally decided let's do it and record it. Put do it out it. there. Might as well share it. Mm-hmm. And so a little bit about how we met. Fiona and I met at work in July of 2017, and we quickly became friends, and soon after that became work wives. Uh, we love to talk, and for the past year or more, we knew we wanted to do a podcast together. And our first idea for a podcast was to cover long-term missing children's cases, but a true crime podcast covering crimes against children isn't so easy to do. So then we just thought of shooting the shit like we do and recording it with no real purpose other than entertainment, hopefully. But then we thought, who the hell are we? And then we just realized that we easily have crucial conversations together as we've done over the years. Uh, We may not always agree with each other, but we can definitely have conversations without getting emotional and we can always see each other's point of view. Critical thinking and critical dialogue is essential to all of us. So we thought this is it. And then the F&T show was born. Um, the first question is, what does your name mean? Do you know? Oh, I do, yeah. What? It's, I researched in case you didn't. It's like fair one. Yeah, like as and in like pale? pure and stuff, yeah. <laughs> That's, yeah. What did it say? Oh my gosh, I need my glasses. Yeah, thought to have been coined by a Scottish poet in the 19th century. Hasn't been around that long. Nope. According I to some resort. Pretty new. Means fair or pale or white. Yeah. That's a good one. That works. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm not really like named after anybody though. I was just like, my mom just looked at me and she's like, yeah, her name's Fiona. The end. I like it. Now, what does your name mean? Well, it's made up. Obviously. Combo of Terry. And so I had to look that up. That was my dad's name. And it, which means powerful, powerful and ruler of the people. So bossy. And (laughs) it exudes strength and it's rooted in leadership, apparently. And then the two ends in my name are from my mom's maiden name, Nun, which can be found in usa uk scotland and canada and it just literally means a nun oh so i'm so you're a-, a powerful strong independent bossy nun yes or just bossy nun bossy nun you're bossy, bossy nun. nun what's my question your question is if you could have one superpower what would it be that's one of my questions. <gasps> Great minds think alike. Uh, yes. And the answer I keep coming up with in, in oh my, invisibility. And you want to be a creeper? No. Uh, well, that sounds like it, doesn't it? But I'm not really sure why invisibility. But I think I can use it for like, if, if people are in danger too, mm-hmm. like then I could sneak in without being seen or that kind of thing. But also sometimes, yeah. You know, you really want to hear what people are saying. Fly on the wall. Oh, and, and then you could just disappear and then nobody would be able to find you. That would be perfect for it? writing time. Mm-hmm. Writing time, creative time. Or but just I don't like. Know. like yeah. Leave I don't really room. know why invisibility, but that's the one that keeps coming up. So I'm not really sure. Maybe I was had that superpower in a former life or something. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> I need a chair so I don't have to fidget. Are you on the bed? I am just kneeling in front of the bed. Like oh. it's I'm about to pray. <laughs> you are a nun. <laughs> yes. So if I had a superpower, it would be that I would never get tired. Mm. And that I could just like have 24 hours a day, like every day, all the time. Like, can you imagine just the shit you get done? You get so much shit done. You get like all the shit that you had to get done and then you'd still have energy Mm -hmm. and time to do the shit that you actually, that's actually, I don't want to say that's actually important. Ooh, yeah. Because everything's important, but you know, like putting away laundry, it's important, Mm -hmm, but But boring. Mm -hmm. Um, So yeah, never getting tired, never getting exhausted. My brain just being on all the time and never having to shut off. Because it is on all the time, but you have to turn it off. Yeah yeah um well and i never really get to use it for some of the things that i want to do because you know and then plus you know if you're working or 
parenting and doing all that stuff like by the time you actually get to sit down and do the creative stuff that you want to do you're just so tired and exhausted and Mm -hmm. or then you suddenly have that time but it's like midnight so then you stay up till three yeah and then you have to get up and work at like six and then you're like just setting yourself up for failure yeah because then that's super but yeah then you're definitely tired Mm-hmm. But, but if I didn't have, quality. but if I didn't need sleep, I could literally write for eight hours a night. Like, think about it. We sleep like eight, like, you know, recommended is what eight hours. Mm-hmm. That's like eight hours out of your day. Mm-hmm. Think how much shit you can get done. That's like a regular work day. I sleep as much as I am at work. I could get so much done. Mm-hmm. Like, look at how much stuff you get done at work. And then mm-hmm. I spend that much time sleeping. Not very much time for creating. No. And then we try, we try to set an early start time for creating. And then turns out we have to be technical wizards. <laughs> and so two we're not getting much later. time. Yeah. Like literally two hours. That's how much it took us to be here. And all you had to do was go in the other room. <laughs> Which means that even if there's a snowstorm tomorrow, we can, we can do another episode mm-hmm. with vodka. And... Now, this two superpowers, imagine if you were invisible so you could hide. Mm. Oh, right. And you never got tired. Holy, that is, we need to make a character that has those superpowers. Superpowers. Mm -hmm. I like it. Maybe we can name that character like a combination of my name and your name. (laughs) Farin. Tarona. 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 That's That's not bad. Oh, well, that leads right into my next question. Oh, I love it. Let's go. Yeah. What are your nicknames? And please explain how you got them. You did that on purpose. You're an asshole. <laughs> what? I didn't. What? Brother, what do you used to call me? You oh. did that on purpose. <laughs> I don't even remember. I, <laughs> I actually. Childhood trauma there. <laughs> yeah. I did not. Tell me that when I had COVID, I don't. Re- I actually don't even remember what. what Fifi or PP? I already forgot. Fifi or PP? I thought it was. <laughs> I'm gonna PP. <laughs> I told you that, didn't I? Yes, but I don't remember things. Yes, but now I do me. remember the jokes because <laughs> they call me Fifi or PP. Fifi or PP. You're an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> you're trying to get a reaction of me, like, oh so that's a perfect setup for what our podcast is about because you assumed my intent <laughs> and, <laughs> and then you really you just forgot and <laughs> you made a story in your head that and your conclusion was i was an asshole which who can't be an asshole but i actually was so proud of this question because i <laughs> because i like nicknames and i know one of your nicknames because i gave it to you what Fenona? Fenona, yeah you weren't the first person to call me Fenona. i know. shut up <laughs> this is not going in the podcast it's cut out <laughs> yeah it was a <laughs> sorry Gold i didn't on. give it to you it's not really what... that's what i call you that's what you call me yeah yes I, mean, I didn't really mean I gave it to you because I actually do not know. Yeah, I don't know yeah, where. Like, I know I don't know where you came. Like, you invented it on your own. You've never heard anybody else call me it. But no, All right. So you only have two two nicknames: the one that gives you childhood trauma, and fee and oh, I well, almost it said that. Me- P-P. It doesn't really give me childhood trauma anymore, but it was annoying. Yeah. Like, who wants like peepee? Like, I used to get Fifi. Yeah, you Fee-fee. hate. That. What about you? Do you what's your nicknames? Uh, do you actually want to know, or you just think you have? No, to- I do want to know. I yeah. actually don't. I don't know if you I don't, know you. Do you even say my name? Like, what do you call me? Except for just in there, you did the thing. Like, I don't actually like people to say my name because, in my experience, they only ever use it when they're being stern, or they want me to focus, or <laughs> they like it's a terrific. Like, it's usually in a rude way because I get called anything but that including the nicknames i'll tell you but do what do you even like wifey maybe oh yeah wifey oh yeah that's a nickname like if like i'm just thinking like if we're at work or whatever and i need to get your attention that is what you call me wifey or or i kick your chair Mm -hmm. or sneak up behind me and scare the shit out of me well i try not to do that that's why i try to kick your chair yes (laughs) but see why i get scared because now you're doing the same 
listening to the true crime in the headphones. So sometimes I'll be in the middle of like, it's the most intense part. Like what's it? And then tap, tap. And yeah, scary. We're going to have to have a thing like with the, cause it's like turning me into like a paranoid freak a little bit. Well, because it happens. Yeah. The world is not rainbows and unicorns. There's some mm. crazy people out there. Anyway, we're not going to get into that, but no, that's a different episode. But see, see why I'm like I am. Mm-hmm. Hard to be rainbows. Mm-hmm. Now, what are my nicknames? I know a T is just an easy one that e? they say. I get called that a lot, especially in sports, because it's easier to say. Um, my brother, well, one brother in particular calls me Tarzan. Both of them did, but yeah, Matthew Tarzan. still calls me Tarzan. I did ask them where that came from, and. They weren't really sure exactly. So, yeah, but that's not like, that's just my brothers, but they still will write it. And the little message, Hey, Tarzan Um, and sister, because I have two brothers. So a lot of sisters are called sister. Um, That might be it that I had written down. Do you think (laughs) those are the three most common because the other ones, if I thought of them, I'd have to look them up. I really need to get my um, glasses for this. All right. Yeah, that was yeah. it. Not that exciting. Maybe we'll cut that one out. Who knows? Fifi, OPP. <laughs> <laughs> Childhood trauma. Oh. No, we can't put that in, though, because then that's probably how you'll be known for the rest of the podcast. It's Fifi, OPP. I don't yeah. care. Oh, okay. What are you passionate about in life? Oh my God. I think everything. (laughs) (laughs) No, a lot. Well, oh, well, of course, family, friends, like socializing and spending time at home. I'm a homebody. Mm -hmm. Um, Sports, true crime, creating, writing, Mm -hmm. podcasting. Now that's a new passion. Actually, I do enjoy podcast. I've been listening to podcasts for years, so. Mm-hmm. I just never thought I would do one since I don't. Speaking is not my forte. But here, I'll become a better here speaker, I guess. It. Yeah. Awesome. What about um, you? Passionate. My family, for sure. My kids. Um, Creating, writing, even though I don't spend nearly enough time doing it. Um, you need that superpower. I do. I really honestly do. If I wasn't tired, I'd be able to accomplish so much more <laughs> in my life. And just being, I don't know, a good person. Ooh. Just doing my doing my best to lately. I guess this is more like a new passion, but just it's gonna sound really like froofy. Froofy. <laughs> you can... froofy. You but just being like just being the best person that I can be and just, you know, putting more good out in the world little bit at a time mm-hmm. um yeah i'm kind of passionate about that and just do you what are yeah rainbows and unicorns yeah mm. and but what's that other creature so a rainbow unicorn but also what was that rainbow dinosaur or something oh that was when you were cranky that's when i'm cranky a unicornosaurus rex or something Unicorn- yeah i think so. unicornosaurus rex <laughs> we'll have to find a picture of it <laughs> okay doesn't come out very often no but what bodily function or oh fluid like bodily thing grosses you out the most grosses me out the most I don't know how personal are we getting here um <laughs> probably just that one time of the month yeah oh i never thought of that mm-hmm. mm, because you don't have to. Mm. <laughs> because i'm old be yeah because you don't have to i can't freaking wait i'm counting the days but that'd mm-hmm. probably be my one thing just mm-hmm. interesting i never thought of that yeah just mm. the whole it's just gross mm-hmm I mean, obviously needed, but still gross. Yeah, and very inconvenient. Mm-hmm. So inconvenient. You have to schedule everything around it. And gross. Yeah. Mine is snot. 
it's mm-hmm. just disgusting. I can't. And anything that it's not like like even if it's not snot if it's long and gross and stringy i can't see there you go yeah i can't it actually makes me vomit and you had three children yeah it's not it's not very gross slash boogers but it's not but, not oh, not. but also boogers but it goes back to elementary school each class had a soccer team and you get to pick a name but i think every one of them had the teacher's name in it so i won't say the teacher's name but they were called the Picket Flickets. Oh, yeah. no, yummy! So I have one more. Okay. Oh, it's not very. If you could go back and give your eighteen-year-old self one piece of advice, what would it be? Oh, very. Well, it kind of goes hand in hand, but one is stop planning for what if or like keeping all your options open. For instance, I took a bachelor of science because that gave you more options. Now I love science, so I probably would have taken one anyway, but I might have more stuck with biology, psychology, and then tried to get some English in there. But I really loaded up with the chemistry and the calculus, even though I didn't like that just in case, because then I could go anywhere with science. Um When really I didn't probably, I probably wasn't going to do anything with that anyway, because I don't really like it and it's not my forte. Mm -hmm. So, but I didn't want to close any doors. Does that make sense? So, and also biggest thing is the subtle art of not giving a fuck is a great book because really that's the the biggest thing, right? I guess that kind of ties in with don't like, not what if, like, just like, don't give a fuck. Well, it's not so much don't give a fuck. It's no, that's so not what it about, means. about like being more selective about what you spend your fucks on, I guess. That's be. what, and that's what that means. That yeah. book, he says it doesn't mean you don't care or don't give a fuck. Yeah. It means you only have so many fucks to give, as everyone has heard. And so you have to be selective on. What well, you, you get to do. choose, right? Mm-hmm. You get to choose what you care about or what you give a fuck about, as opposed to like caring because you can't care about everything. Mm-hmm. If I could go back to my 18 year old self probably along the same lines like or no you know what just to not give up and just to keep going and that hard times are all relative I guess but they pass and just to keep Mm -hmm. going and to to appreciate the good moments you know Mm -hmm. you know and not to think that I mean everybody goes through hard times but just to I guess not really advice it would be more of a reassurance you know that your you know your future holds some hard times but there's always that light at the end of the tunnel it sounds really corny and cheesy but it's true right but when you're in that moment you like think especially when you're younger and you're like oh Mm -hmm. my boyfriend broke up with me and I'm so heartbroken Mm -hmm. you know but just more so that you keep it in perspective keep in the present and just keep going Mm -hmm. i was gonna say it sounds like kind of that's another thing try to stay more in the moment Mm -hmm. i was always it's funny though because you're we're raised like especially when we're going through school that's what we're going through school for think of your future think of your future what what are you gonna be what are you gonna be when you grow up so we're kind of trained to not be in the moment yeah and always think ahead and think what if well, if you do this, this is going to ruin your life. Like, what will your options be? And like, it's just a little, little intense, I guess. And so. Then you're afraid to take like any risks because you're like, well, what, what will that be in my future? Mm-hmm. You know? So it's hard to be in the moment. Yeah. Well, I think that, that wasn't it. That's, isn't there an expression where it says um, anxiety is worrying about the future. Depression is thinking about the past and we don't spend as much time in the present. Like, isn't that a. I think that's a quote. Well, I'm probably saying it all wrong, but makes sense though. It does. Mm-hmm. You gotta live in you, you gotta live in the moment. I mean, obviously you have to worry about the future, but well, yes. All right. So n- this is not philosophical. It is just <laughs> name the first three Christmas gifts you remember getting as a child. They don't have to be your favorite, other just the first three to come to mind. <laughs> oh my gosh. Or it doesn't have to be um... three just whatever you i remember when i was two 
or three. Wow. I got one of those like um horse things with like the bouncy oh horse oh that you sit on yeah yeah i got one of those That's definitely awesome. got uh she-ra castle one year do you remember she-ra Ooh, i do like, I, I i got the crystal palace yeah you're oh. six and a half or something years younger than me so i don't know my brothers are more into that they're four and five years younger so um but they were probably yeah. into like he-man they he, and skeletor yeah and skeletor yes no i got one year i got crystal palace i got she-ra nice and another year probably the other one i remember big was a big one was my parents got us um the walt disney play set where it was literally like walt disney like the little well, it wasn't little it was huge and they had set it all up and they had it closed off like in, a, in another room and everything with doors closed what do you mean so, like what did you you like could go into it like, no, or it was like a play set like the disney christmas village of 88 wow all right my so those are the three that i remember what about you those are awesome ones and good memory because <laughs> i i remember me and my brothers got a toy kitchen a kitchen set we loved that it was downstairs we had to go downstairs mm. to see the secret present um and i don't remember i just remember it was a little little windmill and i'll have to find a picture if i can it might have mm-hmm. been a strawberry shortcake but it might have just been random I know I'll remember what they were back in the day and you may or may not have heard of them. Um, but they were just little figurines and you like they had a little loop on their head and you put them on the windmill and they went around. I loved it. I don't know why. Just little figurines. I could play. Don't Obviously, remember that one. I don't remember what it's called. I meant to research so that I would be able to tell you. But and also a hamster. I love ham. I had hamsters all the time and I don't remember which hamster I got. I remember when I first met you, you had rats. Yes. Which rats did I have? I'm assuming the last ones you had. Like your most. Oh, right. Yes, it would have been because then my eye. Yes. So like Avery and Brady and Chapman and Oreo and yeah, them. Yeah. And two more. But how many did you have? We had 10 in total, not at one time, but six at one time once and four the first time. Oh, Stardust. Yeah. So what made you want to get rats for pets? Well, I didn't want a dog at the time or a cat because we were always out and the kids were really like they were much younger. And so rats and I always enjoyed hamsters, but they're not like, except for this one hamster I had, Montgomery. She was like. (laughs) <laughs> she oh you had to see montgomery she was the best montgomery <laughs> cookie bolton oh my gosh what a name she was not a normal hamster like she would sit on my shoulder at nighttime when i was reading tales of a fourth grade nothing or are you there god it's me mm-hmm. margaret and i would eat oranges with a little sprinkle of sugar on them and i would eat some and then give her a little piece and then eat Aww. and i put her in a wagon she would let me pull her around in the wagon Oh my god, how old were you? Eight, nine, ten. Wow. She um she got tape stuck to her because I made her a maze with a cardboard box. But that didn't work out so well. But and hamsters don't like to get wet. So we had but we had to use rubbing alcohol to get it off of her and then obviously Aww. wash that and then hair blow dryer. She didn't care. No? She just sat there the whole time. No, usually that, yeah. Then my other hamsters were 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 more normal hamsters. Um, so she spoiled me. So I kept getting these other hamsters who just were like, they're not as friendly. So rats are to me, they're just like rodent dogs because they're very, very, very smart. And they're hamster like, obviously, but uh, they're friendlier than hamsters. They rarely bite and you can train them to do all kinds of things if you have time, but you also don't need to train them. Thank God, because I didn't have time. So we just had them. They were so cute. So that was a compromise in uh, pets. And our first three were, I can't remember. Someone had a dream about getting pets. Anyway, they already had them named. And then these three rats were doing what the children had thought of for these names. One was named in and out And when it went in the pet store, it was putting its head out of the, the um, little plastic house that it had. And then back in. And then in and out. Oh my god! And then this one was a girl, but 
she was running on the wheel and Allison had wanted had wanted to name a pet Sir Runs a Lot. And she was running a lot. So she was Sir Runs a Lot. And then uh, Sarah picked Scaredy Rat for the other one. Scaredy Rat. She was not scared. She scared me, but she was not scared. Cute. Those are very original, very creative names. Aren't they cute? Yes. You'll have to put some pictures of your pet rats up on Instagram. You used to take them to the rink in our hoodie pockets. Are you serious? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, they go everywhere. So the big famous question, did Jack have to die? So Titanic comes out. We're recording this at the end of January. And of course, they're releasing Titanic for their 25 year anniversary in theaters in the month of February. So that's in a couple weeks. I do believe it's, is it Valentine's Day? I can't remember the release date. Anyway, it's coming out next month. Um, so I have to ask you, Trin, how many times did you see Titanic in theater when it came out 25 years ago? Still blows my mind that it was 25 years ago. Mm-hmm. I don't I don't remember. I don't know if I even saw it in theater. I must have. But I, I know I've seen it a lot of times. Um, definitely when it, was, it, when it was on one of the streaming services. And I think I even owned it on VHS or DVD or perhaps both. But VHS I have watched it a lot of times. Pardon? It was- it was two tapes on VHS. Oh, then I didn't have that. I must have had DVD. Oh, really? Because so, I don't know. I I don't remember any um particulars, but I know I've seen it a lot of times. And of course, the scene that grosses me out the most is when they're hawking loogies off of the deck. Oh, I know. It's so nasty. That is so disgusting. But I mean, as there's we, many other we, scenes I enjoy, but I just... As we, <laughs> we talked about your thoughts on not yeah well that's why then everyone could guess what's my least favorite scene in the titanic the loogies oh so gross so myself i was probably uh, i was like 16 or 17 when titanic came out and of course leo was just like you know loved leonardo dicaprio Mm -hmm. um loved to been a lot of movies but of course romeo and juliet when he played Romeo, did it for me. Uh, so I think I saw it in theater a total, I think three times. And I feel like that's still pretty low for that time. Like, I feel like a lot of people saw it a lot more than that. But of course, I've seen it more than that over the years. But I've definitely seen it three times in theater. Wow. And yeah. I'm impressed that you remember that. Well, it was Leonardo DiCaprio. Well, just an interesting tidbit. I was just Googling it here while you were speaking because I knew he was born in November of the same year as me, but I couldn't remember if it was on my birthday or not. But no, he was born November 11th, 1974. So he's three days older than me. Oh, look at that. Mm -hmm. Well, would you look at that? Would you? So he's also a Scorpio. Oh, Scorpios. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's kind of like a fun little tidbit can't believe Mm -hmm. once again 25 years i haven't watched it with my kids yet um my son my oldest son went through uh, a big titanic phase when he was younger he was just completely fascinated with everything titanic and um yeah but i i don't think he's actually seen it so i'm i'm caught he's 14 now so i'm thinking about taking him to see it in the theater Mm-hmm. But just, some scenes are so heart wrenching. Like you want to protect them from that, right? <laughs> mm-hmm. Um, but I think he'd, I think he'd like it. I think he'd enjoy it. Oh yeah, I think so. And he, you know, because he was, he was a huge like Titanic fan. Oh my, like fan. I mean, fanatic. Like everything. Mm-hmm. He's got books up there. He had like a model. He had oh so much stuff. Titanic. He was. Wow, and if you brought him to the graveyards over here in the American Uh, Museum of Atlantic yeah my dad actually took them so and and the other thing that he was a really big into um was the Halifax explosion Mm -hmm. right so like a combination of doing like the Titanic Halifax explosion he was just I don't know fascinated just wanted to know the history of it all and he was young he was like six or seven so for those of you who haven't seen the movie Titanic um it's a movie done by James Cameron. 
Uh, it was released in 1997 and has two characters, main characters, I guess, uh, Jack and Rose. Um, the Titanic was a British passenger liner operated by the White Star Line. She sank in the Atlantic Ocean on April 15th, 1912, during her maiden voyage from Southam- Southampton, uh-huh. England, to New York City uh, in the U.S., there were not a lot there were not enough lifeboats for everyone on board um there were 2208 souls on board 1496 died and 712 were saved that's so sad that's a lot of people mm-hmm. and yet here i was smiling while you were saying that because ringer is snorting beside me oh hi ringer he misses oh, me he heard you hey, so that wasn't very good that's not very good for the the video dude Oh, one of the characters, Jack Dawson, who was played by Leo. Oh, Leo. I had Leo all over my locker and posters <laughs> in my room. Like, I'm telling you, I was in love with him. Anyway, uh, so he wasn't supposed to be on the Titanic, his character, and he won his third class ticket on the unsinkable ship playing poker. And he was an artist who lives his life day by day. Uh, second character you're gonna make fun of me is Rose Dewitt Bucator. Hey, Very good. Mm-hmm. and played by Kate Winslet. Um, she was a fictional first class passenger on the Titanic who was engaged to Cal Hockley, played by Billy Zane. Um, so yeah, it was an arranged engagement to maintain social status. Rose is not in love with Cal and does not want to marry him. And she and Jack met when she threatens to jump overboard. And yeah, that's crazy. That scene is so intense. Mm -hmm. Um, And Jack convinces her not to. They fall in love and both manage to survive the sinking, but find themselves awaiting rescue in the very cold Atlantic Ocean waters. And like the word frigid there, huh? Frigid. Did I not say frigid? You said the very cold very cold well i was just thinking about how cold it would have been i'm just teasing frigid cold icy so then to determine if jack needed to die we have to know how he died and the events um leading up to how he died and some of the factors involved so jack and rose both survived the actual singing but that that made them obviously plunge into the frigid Atlantic Ocean water. Um, and at first they're not together. They're looking for each other. And there are a lot of people who have fallen into the ocean and are, who are still alive. Um, and they're all splashing around. And Rose is calling out for Jack. She has a life vest on. Jack doesn't. She's calling out for Jack. And as she's looking for him and swimming around, another man tries to save himself by climbing on top of her which pushes her head underwater for probably about two seconds um and jack actually found her and swims over and punches the guy in the face until he lets go then he leads rose to a piece of wooden debris that he found in the water um now that wooden debris has been referred to most of the time as a door it does look like a door yeah it does look like a door um we've tried to do some research on that and i've found an article written by it was on insider.com entitled jack and rose weren't on a door on titanic and it would have sunk okay so they refer to the maritime museum of the atlantic who have um artifacts here in halifax nova scotia from the Titanic and also the Halifax explosion, but the one of the largest fragments of debris recovered from the real Titanic is a very familiar looking bit of intricately, intricately carved wood. And that was taken from just over the door to the first cl- class lounge on the ship. So when asked if this, then there's a picture of it. It's it's an artifact in the Maritime Museum of, of Atlantic. And when asked if it had anything to do with the making of Titanic, the Maritime Museum of Nova Scotia first said no, not directly, but then later added, and I quote, a replica of a large piece of carved oak paneling was built for the film based on artifacts from its collection. 
And it was used in the climactic death scene in the film where the character Rose clings to floating wreckage. So it seems that the piece of debris represents a piece of the wooden door frame above the first class lounge. So it's not a you door, it's a wood frame. That's what we could find. It's kind of crazy though, because like here it is, like this movie's 25 years old now, right? And we all when we all saw that movie, like I don't think I've ever referred I've never heard anybody else refer to it anything besides a door. Mm -hmm. So we saw this movie like 25 years ago and we all assumed that it was a door without actually knowing the facts that it, if it was in fact a, do a door or not a door, and you know, when in fact, and even James Cameron himself said it wasn't a door it was wood, wood paneling like you mm -hmm. said that in their debut and i guess it's supposed to be they're releasing a special next month um about the titanic 25 years later it's supposed to be on national geographic i do believe and he said that they're gonna like debunk it or do their own thing and he said it wasn't a door it was right wood paneling. and wood paneling i know you said you found an article that says it's wood paneling which is really the same wood frame wood paneling it's yeah it's part of the wall it's probably it's like wood, a decorative not... part of the ship right right so uh, it not a door. probably like wasn't there probably wasn't much to it especially if it was just there for like artistic purposes or um cosmetic purposes right like mm -hmm. but we all assumed that it was a door like crazy oh it yeah and it's carved oak paneling so oak, which comes into play later based on lots of lots of information we have to put in the info basket in the info to basket. decide if Jack really had to die, right? Mm -hmm. Um now what else? So the door, it wasn't really a door, so the wood piece. Okay. So now we know what this piece is. They both try to climb on top of it, but it starts to flip over and they both spill back into the ocean. So then Jack tells Rose to climb on top of it herself. And then he just clings to the board, holding her hand with his, the water just basically above his breast line. So most of him is submerged. And then we're led to believe that he died of hypothermia. And when a lifeboat came back to pluck survivors from the water, if there were any, um, and there were actual Titanic survivors who, who did survive um, the night and who had gone into the waters and uh, were rescued. And her character did that as well. So the lifeboat came back and she had to leave the wood paneling, swim over to another man who was also clinging onto some wood, but who didn't make it. And he had a whistle in his mouth and she blew the whistle and they found her. But in order to do that, remember she was clutching um, Jack's hand. She had to let him go. Mm -hmm. And in the movie, she has a hard time because his hand is so frozen and he's not alive we're led to believe and she slips his hand from hers and then he immediately plunges to the bottom of the atlantic mm -hmm. now the debate is did that need to happen did he need to be in such a state that he would not be conscious or alive um uh to not make it onto that like you have been telling me that you've had you've been doing some interesting reading on something that I've only ever heard, you know, did they fit? Would they would have, you know, floated if they were both on it, that kind of stuff. But you brought up something that I never read before. All right. So I did read a theory that people out there believe that Rose actually murdered Jack, whether I don't think it would be an intentional thing, obviously. Um, and the reason being is that he... It actually takes quite a lot for somebody to say that they died of hypothermia because what they actually have to do is they actually have to warm the body to normal temperature after the fact. Mm -hmm. And then the person obviously cannot be revived from the hypothermia and that's when they're pronounced as dead. That's So that's how you're officially dying of hypothermia. Okay. Because until you're warmed up, you don't know if you have succumbed. Right. To the, yeah, to the, to the cold. Or to the to the conditions that they're yeah. in right mm -hmm. so i did read that there's four stages of hypothermia um first stage being 
that they're sh- that, that they're shivering, right? So stage one of hypothermia is when first Rose climbs up on the door and she's shivering, she's shaking, you know, she's chattering her teeth. So you could tell that that's they're in stage one, but they've also been in the water for quite a while, like both inside of the Titanic and now in the ocean. Mm-hmm. They spent a lot of time in the cold water. And then there's a cut scene where it shows her floating on her back on the piece of wood. Um, and she's looking up at the stars, you know, and she's singing the song that yeah. they sang on the front. Um, and she's no longer shivering. And she's you could tell she's kind of like a little delusional. You know, that's part of it as well. So that's considered stage two of hypothermia. But poor Jack Weber is unconscious. So it's unclear if this would be stage three or four. Um, and of course she didn't really check his pulse before letting him go. So we don't really know if he was actually officially dead at that point. But like I said, you can't get a death from hypothermia until that you actually warm the body up. Well, so, I was going to say, so even if she had checked the pulse, well, she might not have gotten one or been able to detect one. Right. And then, right. so the theory goes that if you See, now this is where I'm getting all myself. <laughs> I can't get myself all mixed up. So we have to talk it out like we did before. That's okay. So if a person has hypothermia and they don't have a flotation device, mm-hmm. right? They would sink because they would they would essentially dive drowning because the minute that they would go unconscious, as Jack plainly is, like he's not responding to her. Um, but she's got a hold of him and his arms are on the door. Mm-hmm. So people normally when they have hypothermia, they drown because they go unconscious and then they just can't fight. And they're so exhausted because they're trying to obviously stay afloat in the water that they actually um, take on water and then they sink because the water goes in their body, it goes in their lung, which then causes their body to be more dense than the water itself. Because of course, the reason when we float in water is because we have the same density as water, right? The same. Yeah. Yeah. So now I'm going to have to read that because now I don't know. Wow, that's just, that's very, we're getting really scientific. I love it. The density of the human body is similar to the density of water. And that's what keeps us floating. Because it's, it's also the air. In, yeah, because it's the air in our lungs, right? It acts as like a bubble. Some tissues are denser than water. Others are less dense. And others, muscles are about the same. So overall, without the air in the lungs, it looks like most people would sink. Yeah. So So if you have, you know, your lungs full of water, you're going to be more dense than the water. So you'd sink. Mm -hmm. Right. And of course, there's that heart wrenching scene at the end where she lets go of Jack and he sinks. Like immediately. And like immediately, like he just, he goes down. I see some bubbles come out, Mm -hmm. but I'm not sure. I did try to replay it. Whereas if he actually died of the hypothermia or say if he had an invisible cut or something like that and he bled out, because you don't know that either. Yeah. Like there's so much going on. Like he could have sliced his leg open. Maybe he bled out and that hypothermia is all that is visible that you see. So if he died from other causes, say like a big gash on his leg and she like, oh, he actually would have floated because the lung, the, the air still would have been in his lungs and he would have floated. Right. Because it wasn't long until until the water obviously went into his body which would then cause him to sink right because if he if he had been dead well wait but i think you still have to be dead for hours don't you before the air completely leaves you yeah so he wasn't dead long enough even if he would like say he was dead he wasn't dead long enough he would have floated right he so would it, yeah he would have the same thing yeah and yeah, so he would have been stayed floating there with her until, you know, he might have gone down by the time the Carpathia came. I'm not really sure. But either way, we know that that oh, doesn't right. happen because he sinks. Right. So just an interesting fact that maybe she should have checked his pulse or taken him into the boat with them, but then she wouldn't have been rescued and then they both would have died. So who knows? It's just yeah, an interesting theory. Mm-hmm. Well, it does seem that he took on. Well, and I was reading that a lot of the titanic victims that didn't have life vests uh succumbed to hypothermia so went unconscious like you're saying Mm -hmm. and then most sort of actually drowned that would have been their cause of death but Mm -hmm. caused by the hypothermia yeah that Mm -hmm. seems and we actually have a statistic that 
there was seven there was 705 survivors that night and you have to remember how long they were in the water so we looked up this we looked up the timeline that the titanic went into the water at 2 20 in the morning right so a lot of the people were in the water at this point so this is when we know that jack and rose fell into the water and then by the time the titanic hit the ocean floor only four minutes later that's when the lifeboats decided to go back and look for survivors which wasn't a huge amount of time but still four minutes in the cold water especially if there were people that were already in the water for a period of time like that four minutes is a lot right and, that's and this jack and rose were like the last ones to go in so many people mm-hmm. were in before that and i don't think the lifeboats they didn't get gathered that quickly i don't think well no they started they had- to gather and then by the time they got back you know there were because they more had to minutes. transport like a lot of the like combine a lot of the boats to free up space so that all the boats didn't have to go back right mm-hmm. that's the way it was portrayed in the movie whether that actually happened or not once again and even looking at the statistics like so overall it was 700 survive 705 survivors right there was three mm-hmm. from the titanic there is 328 bodies that were found floating in the water once again don't know i wouldn't assume that they would take them in lifeboats i'm gonna say that that's probably when the carpathia came around so those are probably the people that um maybe had the life vest still on 328 because the that bodies was are from, still floating right we're gonna talk about that that's the recovery from the halifax the canadian vessels oh halifax. okay yep and there were actually so that's 705 survivors 328 bodies that were found and there was 2,227 people on board the Titanic. So, like, literally half the people were, they sank, right? They're gone, yeah. Yeah. I think I think the Carpathia might have picked up some bodies right away, but I don't, I can't remember. But uh, we're going to talk about how many of the Canadian ships actually did pick up, which is the majority yeah. of the bodies that were recovered. Mm-hmm. But I do think the Carpathia might have picked up some. Rose really played a big part in his, his death because, you know, if she had just gotten on that lifeboat that she was on to begin with and hadn't climbed off. Yeah. Jack, Jack seems to be very resourceful. He would have figured it out a way. Yeah, this is my conclusion. So I don't want to give it all away. But yeah, he seems mm-hmm. to be re- very resourceful. And obviously he found that piece of debris. So if Rose was already in a lifeboat, he could have been on that debris. It's true. Yeah. And then they could have been reunited at the end. Aww. Yeah, but then they're they're together. And then, I mean, who would have thought to take his his body? You would have assumed he was dead, right? Mm-hmm. Just as she did, I'm sure. She wouldn't have let mm-hmm. him go if she had known any of this. But uh, but then in the end, she did. So really, if he could have been revived, we'll never know. But it was 1912. 19- so. 12, yeah. Yeah, that's... Like we oh, said yeah. earlier, not sounding good for Jack. Poor Jack. Yeah, so but how to get there? Did Jack have to die? The number one thing people say, and the most obvious one, is first you have to know if they would fit. Fit right. on the debris together. And technic- the answer technically is yes. And I'm using an article from The Guardian. Um, all did Jack really have to die to save Rose at the end of Titanic? Um and they have a lot of scientific information and mathematical calculations in here. But basically, Leonardo DiCaprio is 180 centimeters, and Kate, or Rose, is 169 centimeters. And then it says the average shoulder width of a man, woman, and all that stuff. And so basically, they form a body warmth carrying total of 76.3 centimeters on this piece of debris. Wow, that's-, that's, the, that's the size they need. Uh, the raft was 183 centimeters by 91 centimeters. And so if you look at all those numbers, which I'm not even going to do, but for those that want to, apparently there's room to spare. So they d- mathematically would have both spare. fit. And I know that on Twitter and everything, there's all kinds of people are posing on the wood. Um, yeah. But that would have been if the if the wood was like on the ground or something, but like the, the wood is in water. So there's a buoyancy thing too, right? Ooh. Next step, yep, buoyancy. You want to see what the research said on the buoyancy? Oh, you did the research on the buoyancy. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, so there's two parts of the buoyancy. Um, There's just, if they both were on it, would they have 
would it have sunk? Would it have floated and kept them out? Myth Mythbusters tested this in 2013 and came to the conclusion that the wood alone with their two bodies on it wouldn't have been buoyant enough. But they said that if Jack, and they say Jack, but what I feel they mean is if either one of them had taken Rose's life jacket and fastened it to the bottom of the wood, like, I don't know why Rose can do that, but I suppose being true in character, Leo would have, well, I mean, not Leo. Oh dear. Look what your mate, <laughs> Jack would have done. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, Jack probably Leo. would have done it, but he's not the only one that had to do it, but they refer to Jack all the time as being the one. So for Rose, he's a gentleman. Give, he's a gentleman. Yeah. For Rose, when it was 1912, I guess. So for Rose to give her jack, her life jacket to uh, Jack, not to warm him up, but so that he can swim underneath. He's almost already almost frozen to death. Swim underneath, fasten it yeah. up. Would that have kept him afloat? So this yeah, article speed up that down. hypothermia process and yeah. put one yeah. little little part of Jack is above the water and put him submerged in the water and let's fight that hypothermia expert round. <laughs> Yeah, I like that. <laughs> and tie a life jacket underneath the piece I mean, of wood. you're trying to survive, so I suppose, right? But, oh, and it also depends on the type of wood, because each wood has a different kind of buoyancy. So, these people are really scientific. Too, okay, but I've just had to add this, too. Like, to tie, like, the fine motor skills that that would require, and you're just struggling to, like, breathe and keep your heart mm -hmm. going without passing out from the cold, and you're going to be able to tie a knot? I highly doubt that. Right. And we're going to go on the timeline. Like you had mentioned earlier, they've already been before the ship sank in and out of water, but mostly in uh, for over an hour, like an hour and 20 minutes. And then they've been in the water since 2.20. Mm -hmm. And I watched the movie and timed it just for, you know, it's just a movie, I know. But it took them about two minutes before they're settled on the the uh, piece of wood here, the wood paneling. Right. Um. So that's, I think, is it about it's 15 minutes or less that you're fully unconscious? So I think around five minutes, you're pretty, it's not good. Like you said, the fine motor skills. So what is well, your I research? Have, I have a quote here from a medical website, uh, emedicinehealth.com. And it says a person mm -hmm. who is immersed in near freezing water at temperatures uh, 32 and a half degrees Fahrenheit or 0 0.3 degrees Celsius will have symptoms of mild hypothermia in under two minutes and will be unconscious in less than 15 with an expected survival time of 15 to 45 minutes. And that's so, in 0 0.3 degrees Celsius? Mm-hmm. Oh, uh, and the water, yeah. you can, you know, this one. Do you remember the water was like minus 2.2 .2 degrees Celsius that night? Or 28 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so way colder than that. Way table. Colder. We're not oh. doing the math about now how long that would, how many minutes that would shave off your survival time. But obviously it's less. You get less we'll be, time. Yeah, it would be less. And once again, like to have the fine motor skills to go back to you of Jack and or Rose say, hello, Penny. Um, you know, yeah. to be able to tie anything or to even logically think probably like even your reasoning skills and your logic skills would probably be oh. diminished, mm -hmm. diminishing, if not dim diminished at this point. Okay. For sure. It, it, when she's walking by you, she's making you have like- I know, the cat wants to get in on the discussion. <laughs> okay. So type of wood, the type of wood that was commonly used to build fixtures on the real Titanic were teak. I've never heard of that. Pine and oak. And according to Physics Central, which who contributed the scientific stuff to this Guardian article, teak would have been far too heavy and would have sunk under its own weight, let alone adding Rose and Jack on top of it. So if it was teak, no, no way, no chance of survival. Pine might have allowed them to both be on top of it, might have been buoyant enough uh, and given them time to wait for rescue. But it wasn't pine. As we know, it was oak. Um, which is confirmed by the Maritime Museum of the Atlantic. And so they say, now there's, I'm going to give some more numbers but for those that want them and then just generalize it for those that want to skip over the numbers. But so the piece of oak of that size and thickness has a weight of about 1,920 newtons. And they went and researched- Really technical. Yeah, they went and researched the actors' weights, of course, 
So 715 newtons for Leo slash Jack and 549 newtons for Kate slash Rose, which is combined bulk. So the wood plus the MF 3,184 newtons. And then there's more about the ice cold salt water. And then the oak would give an, in those, uh, Oak in those dimensions in the ice cold salt water would give an upward buoyant force of 2,490 newtons. And they say I'm you don't need to be a scientist. I'm like, I am so not scientific. I don't know what any of this means. So I'm just giving the numbers for those. So 3,184 is bigger than 2,490. So the Jack squirrels just Rose started dancing the in wood. my head there. What? I said the squirrels just started dancing in my head there when you started spewing out. Sorry. Well, for those that want it, and to show that we've done the research. Yeah, now, of course. Very important. This is as far as we can go. I can't do the math or the science of there to prove or disprove physics central, and I don't feel I need to. So I'm going with them, you know, as a trusted but source here. That they prove they right. Prove. They they definitely know more than I do about yeah. newtons and density. So they say that it wasn't buoyant enough that piece of wood paneling. Um, and like I said, MythBusters said, well, with the the life jacket, the modern life jackets top out at uh, two hundred seventy five newtons for buoyancy, so it still wouldn't have been enough. Well, yeah, because so, then if they, even if they were both able to balance on that piece of wood, even if they would fit, like you measured, you know, somebody measured it out and they would have fit. But if they add their body weight, then they both mm -hmm. still, they would have both been in the water. At least she was somewhat out of the water without him on it, that the board was yes. able to stay buoyant enough that it kept her out of the water enough for her to survive and not succumb to the hypothermia and stay conscious. Um, but if they were both on there, then they, both of their bodies would have been in the water so they mm -hmm. both would have even if it was buoyant enough to stay they, they would have both been more yeah in the water yeah. as well yeah. like take the newtons and stuff out of it yeah just not good obviously it would have been more pressure on the board right yeah and here goes the timeline so 11 40 that's when it hits the titan uh, the titanic man we're tired at 11 40 <laughs> that's when it hits the iceberg the, the iceberg scrapes along the side of the deck and jack and rose are actually on the bow of the ship when this happens Right. Um, third class begins to flood imme immediately, and then Jack and Rose here, Captain Smith and Thomas Andrews and others discuss the severity of the situation, and then mm -hmm. Rose and Jack decide to go inform Rose's mom and Cal. Um, oh, Cal. But, yeah, but while they're there, Cal slips that necklace into Jack's pocket, and he gets Spoiler arrested. Alert. And then, yeah, I hope oh. everybody's seen the movie. Spoiler alert. <laughs> Well, it was from 1997, so I assumed. We but, should oh, have yeah. like a disclaimer at the beginning of this episode that has warning spoiler alert if you have not seen the movie. We should. It is a re-release, right? 25 year. Yeah. Well, 15. Uh, Rose and Cal have now been advised to get in lifeboats, and Mr. Andrews reminds Rose of that there's not enough mm. life lifeboats. Um, and then you see Jack, and there doesn't seem to be any uh water yet in that room with him. Not yet. Oh, when he's uh, down on. On E deck, you mean when he's all chained? yeah handcuffed with that guy mm -hmm. who then gives him a yeah, nice gut you... punch. And yeah, leaves you see him. the water rush in. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Twelve forty five a.m. Um, the Titanic fires the first of eight distress rockets, and Rose is on deck right there. You can see, uh, and she looks up in the sky, so she's mm -hmm. on deck waiting for a lifeboat. And now, then they cut to Jack, and the room where he's being held is now uh, below the water because he can he looks out and it's listing and that guy that has some captive is rolling his bullet mm -hmm. down yeah mm -hmm. and then this is when he gives him the gut punch mm -hmm. and leaves him handcuffed so 12 55 a.m rose's mother is in uh life boat number six with molly brown and um rose refuses to get in because the cal and the mother make rude comments Jack tell or not Jack Rose tells them that there's not enough lifeboats, so half the people on the ship are going to die, and one of them, mm -hmm. I believe, the mom says, "No, I don't remember which one says, not the better half." So then Rose has had enough of both of them, mm -hmm. and goes to rescue Jack. And now the window beside Jack is completely submerged, and before Rose reaches him, the water starts pouring in. Um, she makes that lift operator take her down to um, 
E deck. And then when they get there, water gushes into the elevator. Mm-hmm. So right away, she's just, I have a, a big description for those that care. Oh but yeah. There's skip. that, there's that whole scene too, where she's got like the ax, you know, and she's like all in the water and she's like hanging onto the pipe, you know, that's this. So one o'clock yeah. in the morning, E decks filling with water. She gets out of the elevator. She's immediately knee deep, knee deep in water. That's quickly rising. Um, before she reaches him, she's been in water past her thighs. Um, when she's in the room, she has to search for a key. Uh, now Jack, who originally was on top of a pipe and staying a little more out of the water, he's also now in water to his knees. And she has to go back up the stairs, chest deep in water. Like you said, grabs the, I think it's the hose or the, no, gives the axe, the axe. right? Yeah. yeah. And has to punch a man in the face who's trying to save her, mm-hmm. like drag her up away from the water. But she grabs that axe runs toward him, uh, Jack. And now the sh- part of the ship where Jack is, is the water so high that she has to hold on to the ceiling pipes just mm-hmm. to drag herself down the hall. So she's pretty much totally submerged. Uh, and then when she reaches Jack, he's totally uh, submerged to his chest and neck. And now they're both in the water. Once they get away, they're both in the water. And they actually break through a wall to get up on deck somehow. So, and they, oh, remember yeah. they come exploding out and then someone says that they're going to have to pay for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so one thirty in the morning, they've just made it to the top deck. And I do have to say, when I was watching it, they seem very dry for having just been in the water. So that must have been a costume malfunction. Costume but, change. Or maybe they yeah. recorded that scene first before the water scene. Like Kind of like us. We have, we've, we yeah, are look like, totally oh, we're wearing different clothes. Yeah. <laughs> different background, different uh 1 40 a.m collapsible c is lowered that's when the owner uh bruce ismay gets on it and or no the white star chairman bruce ismay everyone got on him for doing mm-hmm. that um cal could have gone on that one but was informed that rose was on the other side trying to get in a boat with jack <clears throat> oh yeah that was the boat that was letting gentlemen on men on right because they were they were still trying to get the men and women off first yeah and so she so she could have gone on with her mother she doesn't then she gets on collapsible d um but then it's being lowered and she sees cal and jack you know and then she jumps off to be with jack so if she had just gone on this then jack could have been on the piece of wood Mm -hmm. Um, and then cal is pissed and has his gun and chases them back down to where the water the part of the ship that's sinking so now they're in the cold water again um and then they see that little boy crying for help and they oh, grab yeah. him, but then the water floods in and now um, it fills the hall and then they have to, they're chased by water all the way up to a gate, which is locked. Um, they free themselves, but they're neck uh, deep and then the guy drops the key mm-hmm. and then it's filling up and so then Jack has to go completely underwater to find the keys and then they finally get out and now like the ship is really sinking and even Cal he grabs that little girl and gets in the lifeboat. Mm. Collapsible A. Yeah. Cal. Not me. <laughs> Come Cal. on, Cal. Cal Hockley. Be a hero. Come on, Cal. Billy Zane playing the what what's uh weird... Scuzz Bucket. He's a Scuzz Bucket. Scuzz Bucket. <laughs> I never did like that guy. I don't <laughs> I don't think he's meant to be like. If anybody likes Cal Hockley, please let us know. Yeah, when comments, you're saying but... no one likes that guy, you mean Cal Hockley, not poor If Billy somebody Zane. has, but maybe somebody has another point of view about him, but he's not mm. a nice dude. What are his endearing qualities? Yes. Oh, uh, yes. Mm. Add to our info bucket on the topic of Cal Hockley, please. Yeah. Because. <laughs> uh, yeah, we're not liking him. <laughs> we're not liking him. At 218, when the bow broke off, Jack and Rose were on the inside of the rails in the stern of the ship. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then as it started to, you know, flip up and is eventually straight up and down, Jack climbs over the rails to be on the outside Mm -hmm. and then brings Rose over. And then you see other people falling to their deaths because they didn't get over. So, and there's one person beside them um, and he's a real life person. He actually drank a lot of alcohol that night. And, uh, Mm -hmm. We'll have to research him, but yeah, he the the character that the guy in the was white he suit, an actual I, guy? Yeah, is he a cook or something? We'll have to look him up right now. Let's look him up. So his That's name's it. Charles Jock. 
Shawhan? Oh, he's a baker. If you remember the movie, baker, you thank call you. a baker drinking from a flask and hanging from a rail during the sinking of Titanic. That man was Charles jo- Johan? 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 Um, who was the head baker on board the Titanic and the famous survivor who got hammered on whiskey. Yeah, so he's he's the guy. So it was Jack, Rose, and Charles. I need the to only ones outside. So they're the last yeah. three that go into the water at 2.20 a.m. I wonder how, so I want to get a little bit on his story though. Like, how did he survive? Like, what did he so, do? He swam to an upturned collapsible lifeboat B and remained by it until he was picked up by one of the other lifeboats. And then he was rescued by the Carpath- Carpathia and arrived in New York on April 6, 1912. So how did he survive in the cold water? It's possible that his blood alcohol content helped him to stay calm and avoid the cold shock response. Interesting. Note to self. Note to self. Okay, so we're talking about the back of the vest that they were on the back of the stern on the other side of the gate, right? And the Titanic goes down, it completely goes under, and then they're in the waters. So amazing that they even found each other, but Well, for sure. And how much energy that would have taken. Like, number one, they were just trying to like not drown and not get sucked down by all the air in the boat. And then (laughs) and then she's like swimming and then she fought off that guy that was trying to like use her as um Life flotation vest. device right or a wood pan and then and then you a just flotation. see that part and, <laughs> and then jack meanwhile is off off somewhere problem solving the shit out of almost being taken out by the titanic right and but he's this- over here problem solving and finding like a freaking door and and then found mm-hmm. rose and well, that's the other thing. The two of them spent, he went off, found something, then found Rose to bring her back. But really, the two of them, instead of just automatically going in the water and trying to find something to get out of there as soon as possible, were looking for each other. They were spending yeah. more time in the water than they needed. Yeah. Young love. Mm. What did it get them? What did it get them? Well, I mean, Rose fared out all right. Mm-hmm. Okay, I gotta save that. Thanks to all Jack. Right. Good job, Jack. All right. Anyway, so they're in the water now and they've already spent a lot of time in the water. Well, I was going to start with they they went in the water. They were holding hands, like you said. They were underneath. Um, I won't go into too much. They, it took them less than a minute to resurface. Like you said, they run into that man who pushes her underneath twice, actually. Um, before Jack comes, punches him in the face, then drags her to the uh, wooden wood paneling. Um, and it takes him about 30 seconds from the time he finds her. It still takes him 30 seconds to find this uh, famous piece of debris on which Rose will survive. Once they get to the the wood paneling, they both try to get on it like we discussed and it immediately tips. So then Jack knows he can't go on with Rose. He just gets her on there. And then he takes the position in which he will become unconscious. <clears throat> mm-hmm. Um. So I so you have a note here that says that this pretty much happens like at 221 with like so almost about three minutes. So technically isn't the Titanic met like it sank at 220 and the Titanic's not even all the way at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean because that happened they estimate around 224, right? So timeline wise, like they've been in the water for about three minutes consistently. Yeah, so at two, almost two, two, two twenty-two, but then at after three minutes, so but at two twenty-three in the morning, um, that's when the movie goes back to Molly Brown, who's trying to convince them to go back for mm-hmm. survivors. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's been almost five minutes when they decide to go back. Yeah, and, and Jack has been survivors. in the water beside the debris, um, and it took that famous pose where he. So he has the conversation with her about promise that she'll survive. And never let go. Mm-hmm, never let go. And that's been about seven and a half minutes that he's been in the water when he finally places his chin on the wood paneling. Mm-hmm. And that's the position that he'll be in when she lets him go. Mm-hmm. That's he sad. Was- but seven and a half minutes in minus 2.2 degrees Celsius, right? And that's at crazy. 0.03 degrees Celsius, 
you're unconscious in less than 15 or 15 max or whatever right so yeah seven i mean that's so and he's still not unconscious yet and he's been um in the water for seven and a half minutes and and then in the ship he was already in the water and then out in the cold air waiting for the ship to sink you know Mm -hmm. yeah so i mean he wasn't a long he wasn't an overly big guy either like he didn't look like he had a meat on him or anything so he had wouldn't have had because they say that you know it takes Mm -hmm. longer to succumb like because obviously you'd have more body fat to provide insulation yeah and he had no life vest he had no life like Mm -hmm. coat on he just had a thin white shirt and it's i i have notes here that the more the body is submerged the faster its heat will be drained yeah so like so his been... body from like the neck down like his arms were out but like literally most of his body was underwater so i feel that like, mm-hmm. i feel like he would have gone down pretty quick yeah so at seven and a half like, minutes to still out. be conscious is quite amazing so mm-hmm. according to the movie you know the rough estimate it's nine minutes <laughs> um now rose is no longer shivering and she's singing weakly and she's looking straight into the sky and looks like she'll fall asleep and jack is of course motionless just bobbing with the water um Mm -hmm. then 30 seconds after that rose sees a flashlight but you can tell she's losing like she's quite out of it she doesn't react like she doesn't really so she's like stage two yeah she doesn't seem to know totally what's going on and she tries to wake Jack up, but now he has icicles hanging from his nostrils and is very unresponsive. Mm-hmm. And then 11 minutes after the ship sank, Rose has been on, she was in the water, well, before it sank, but then about two minutes before she was out on the wood paneling. Mm-hmm. Um, she then closes her eyes and looks like she's just going to give up and go to sleep mm-hmm. because she can't wake Jack up. But then 15 seconds later, she starts yelling for the uh, the lifeboat to come back, but very weakly, they can't hear her. And then she just like we discussed before i think she splashes into the let's jack go Mm -hmm. he sinks she uh swims over to another man who had a life vest and was on a piece of wood paneling but only had half of his body out he had Mm -hmm. a whistle she blows the whistle um and the lifeboat comes back for her and she's rescued yeah so that that's at about two 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 hundred two thirty three a.m according to the movie time so 13 minutes after it sank wow so she only spent about a minute and 40 seconds when it first sank in the water Mm -hmm. and then 45 seconds to to swim over and blow the whistle i mean according to what i see in the movie um but then again people are gonna get bored of us saying that but before it sank she was in the water a lot as well yeah but still like consistently she was in and out in and out whereas like yeah. obviously he was in the cold water for a big chunk of time so he definitely yeah. had hypothermia i actually mm-hmm. have more notes here that um hypothermia sets in more quickly in water as heat is um conducted away from the body 25 times more quickly than in wow. air um and the titanic lifeboats you remember that scene where they like don't want to go back because they're afraid they're going to be pulled under an attack Mm -hmm. um but if you think about it like a lot of they couldn't they would not have been able to they wouldn't have been able to swamp the lifeboats right because they're they were almost incapable of swimming never mind take down a whole boat because even with mild hypothermia it impairs your muscle muscular control and dexterity which once again muscles 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 your muscles and your dexterity which once again Mm -hmm. i'm sorry jack's not tying even rose is not tying a life jacket under a piece of wood no. even like so that's with mild hypothermia at um impairs your dexterity and what's like, how long would it take based on whatever you're reading there to get mild because at first you know that guy was able to push rose under but that was like immediately like 30 seconds or so into the sinking so he could have done that but like was that intentional or was he was that intentional or was that just like a survival instinct like he could have been total adrenaline running pumping you know. oh oh total adrenaline but i think that's yeah it, that's just what drowning people do that's why when i was taking lifeguard training you that's you, you can't go near them because that's just an instinct thing you use yeah. whatever you can use whatever you can to keep yourself out of the water right. from drowning a survival instinct of course if the boat was there would be to try to grab it but you're right uh i've tried to climb back in i went tidal bore rafting and i had a life vest on 
and you're supposed to jump out of the the boat and get back into it and it's just like a rubber raft it's hard to climb into into a boat i had no hypothermia at all this was in the summer and it's um so yeah even the swamping the boat i mean it's highly unlikely and like do you remember the scene where he's like when they actually go through and they're saying um you know they're not moving it doesn't yell that out they're not moving yeah but of course like of course they weren't moving they had hypothermia they were unconscious but they still could have been alive that's the kicker though but of course they didn't know that in 19 what was it 1912 yeah right so like those some of those people could have actually been in love we're gonna wrap it up we've done a lot of talking we've talked a lot about a scientific facts and that's what it's all about it's about putting that shit in the basket we put some shit, the in, shit the basket. in the basket <laughs> shit so, basket the shit basket is that what we're well, calling it i now? don't think Not i in- like the shit basket. oh that's probably a thing from history <laughs> shit basket no shit mm. basket and put that. some information into the basket so in the end for the 25th anniversary of the titanic james cameron with national geographic did experiments to see if jack could have made it we haven't been able to watch the special but i've only seen bits and pieces online but it does seem that in the conclusion james cameron says that if rose had given jack her life vest to help insulate jack um that they both and set they had- up on and they had both set up on the piece of debris that Jack may just have been able to get a whole, I can't talk, but there were still a lot of variables because I mean, they would have had to balance on the board, which I mean, come on. Um, He adds that Jack's, he adds that Jack's thought process is that he is not going to do one thing that jeopardizes, jeopardizes Rose's chance of survival. And like how romantic. Aww. And also that's just 100 percent his character and in the end jack had to die he he said that in a couple articles that like it was in the script that he was gonna die mm-hmm. but, so that so summary then, was just from a good morning america thing that we saw so mm-hmm. i don't even know if that's the conclusion he came to at the end of that, that, that his uh special because i read somewhere that he said he 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 would have he wouldn't have lived no matter what based on this scientific experiment so i'm that- confused I think that's just because he's the producer or the writer and he knew that the character just had to die to make the story to make money. I think mm-hmm. I like I I've definitely read a couple articles that it takes some um, quotes from him saying that he just he would have had to die. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I know he, but I... he probably regrets the way that he died using the board like they should have made the board like smaller or you know something that all, he all quite obviously probably regrets having that piece of wood the size as it was if he just made it smaller then none of this would have even been in discussion what do you what do you think did jack have to die fiona mm, are you asking the writer in me or the non-existent scientific part of me that doesn't understand anything <laughs> um i don't think that the story would have made such a punt in the end if he didn't die uh could Mm -hmm. they have both fit on the door i don't think so i think that they both would have because even if they both fit on the door i think it comes down to buoyancy and that it would have caused the piece of wood to go more into the water which means they both would even if it was halfway both of their bodies would have been halfway in the water and they would have been you know they would both be at risk of getting hypothermia right Mm. um but then they wouldn't have drowned from hypothermia because then they would have been floating. True. They, right. But they, but they wouldn't have, they weren't at that time. They just thought any bodies that weren't moving had already died. They didn't they, know. They had assumed that they had already died. They didn't know mm-hmm. that they would bring them on the boat and then try and warm them up and then mm-hmm. declare them dead. Because once again, it's the early 1900s. So uh, I think, I think he had to die. Poor Jack. Mm-hmm. In order for Rose to to survive, and he wasn't like we said, he wasn't willing to risk her, right? Mm-hmm. So yeah, poor Jack. <sighs> and that's it. Thank you so much for listening. The show wouldn't be possible without you. If you're a fan of the show, please leave us a review where you listen to your podcasts, and don't forget to follow us on Instagram and TikTok at FNT Show Podcast, and on the YouTube channel The FNT Show. Links are in the show notes. Thanks, Fiona, and thanks to everyone listening at home. And remember, we're all on Team Human. And remember to be smart and shit. (laughs) 